changes to your accommodations or to your availability or I know that at least one student has said that they will not be available next Wednesday um, if you could please send me an email and we'll work with you to find a time that works the format of the exam will be the same as it was last time in that there will be 10 multiple choice questions which can be accessed through the quizzes in my courses and two long answer problems those long answer problems will be accessed as assignments and they'll have a, uh, a Dropbox that you can uh, upload your solutions to. Um, I understand what the technical issue was last time with the availability. So we did have to start a little bit late for people um, without accommodations because I messed up a little bit um, how the accessibility to those different assignments work. But now, you know, it seems like every year they, they change how my courses works a little bit. Um, so I just clicked the wrong radio button. I apologize for that. But now I know what that issue was. And uh, at least I won't make that mistake again. So I will hope not to make any mistakes. But um, I will hopefully have learned from that particular mistake. Does anybody have questions? Of, oh, and I guess content-wise, so this will be from the beginning of Open Systems up until the four component ranking cycles that we talked about at the end of last class. So today we're going to start pushing beyond those four component ranking cycles. Um, but that won't really be on the exam. Maybe some of the stuff that we'll talk about in this first section will be on the exam, but you'll see when we do the long answer, um, type example, the first one we do today, it's not really any different from, from a four component um, example that we did before. Um, there are two long answer problems, right? And again, we have two different unit systems. We have two different types of fluid, right? Something that's like water that goes back and forth across the vapor dome. Something that's like air or any other ideal gas that doesn't go back and forth across the vapor dome, right? And there's two long answer problems, right? Um, and then the multiple choice questions, hopefully you have a little bit better idea what that looks like um, now that we've done one exam, but, uh, but I think we won't, um, we won't really deviate from that too much this time. So my intention is to next class have some time that's open where we can discuss the exam if you like, but I'm happy to answer um, any questions as, you know that you have now, especially if they're sort of brief type questions. So I don't see anything in the chat, um, but again, you can always um, you know ask questions uh, in office hours or um, like I said, we'll, we'll try to carve out some time. Um, either next class or Tuesday's class to do some review if you have review questions. All right, so uh, I want to step back a little bit, right? So this, you know, the class is called Thermodynamics for Mechanical Engineers, right? And particularly with what we're talking about now, really definitionally is thermodynamics where we're turning heat energy into work or mechanical power, right? So it's like that steam engine, right, where we're burning something or doing something to get heat, and we're turning that heat into mechanical work. When we talk about Rankine cycles, we're using that heat to boil water, and then that um, that steam has to go somewhere because it's expanding, and we try to force it over the fan blades inside the turbine to get that shaft to spin. So we started off um, talking about Rankine cycles, and it's kind of been interesting as I've been teaching this class. I started in 2013 we've really started to see a shift in, in power generation here in the United States, right? Um, using Rankine cycles a little bit less and using natural gas power plants a little bit more, right? So we will talk about natural gas power plants, not next, but then after that. Um, so sometime soon, probably um, before the end of next week, we'll introduce the idea of natural gas power plants. But even though we've been moving away from both coal and nuclear, um, they still make up almost half of the power that we generate, or at least they did in 2019. It may be that, um, that those numbers are continuing to decrease, right? And when you hear people talk about um, the decrease 
in carbon emissions in the United States, a lot of that is driven by this um, sort of movement from Rankin cycles, from coal power to natural gas. So we're substituting often one fossil fuel for another, but, um, but sort of gaining thermal efficiency as we move from Rankin cycles to Brayton cycles or natural gas power plants. Rankin cycles are heat engines, right? Heat engines are thermodynamic devices that trade heat for work, right? Now, whenever we're characterizing these thermodynamic cycles, we have a different parameter. And for heat engines, we have this um, thermal efficiency, which we write as this eta, which looks like a scripted N. But all of these characterization parameters are the energy benefit of the cycle, the thermodynamic cycle, divided by the energy cost of that thermodynamic cycle, so for something like a coal power plant or a nuclear power plant, we're talking about net power, the power developed by the power plant, divided by the heat that we had to put in to get that power. Right? And we talked about ideal efficiencies or Carnot efficiencies, where we can take T hot minus T cold over T hot, remembering that the denominator here is not a temperature difference, so when we're using those Carnot equations, my advice is always use Calvin or Rankin because then you won't get the wrong answer. So if we're looking at these power plants, what we're going to see is that instead of sort of looking at them as one piece, what we do is we end up taking this power plant, breaking it down into these different Lego blocks and analyzing each individual piece separately right so we'll do a first law analysis on the components that contribute to thermal efficiency so things that generate or consume power or things that add heat into the cycle so for our four component ranking cycle we do a first law analysis on turbines pumps and boilers so for all of those components we'll say that they're at steady state at least initially, we'll say that they have one inlet and one outlet. We'll see that that changes by the end of today's class. Right? We'll say that all of the components here, we can neglect kinetic and potential energy changes. And then for each individual component, we have to say, well, what's its main job? So if it's a turbine or a pump whose main job is to consume or produce power, then we'll say it's adiabatic unless we know something about heat loss, right? But for the boiler, whose main job is to add heat into the system, we'll say that it's passive, in that it doesn't have fan blades inside the system that are producing or consuming power. Now, another thing that we do in all of these cycles we're gonna talk about, at least the cycles with open systems in them, is we'll say that we're gonna neglect friction losses. There's two things that this means. This means that when we're adding or reduce or, or removing heat, we're going to assume that happens at constant pressure. In real life, there's pressure losses in things like um, boilers and condensers, but the power that you lose from that pressure loss is so much less than the power you're producing in, say, the turbine, that at least as a first approximation, you can pretend like you're not losing any power there, right? And that means that you don't have to fix so many states, right? Um, the other thing that we'll say is that the plumbing that connects our different components, we're going to say that there's no heat losses in those lines either, right? And that saves us from doing a first law analysis on the, the plumbing that connects, say, the turbine outlet to the condenser inlet. So we don't have to figure out what the heat loss in that particular um, piece of plumbing is. Although, if you got a first, uh, you know, an exam problem that asked you how to find heat loss, in that case, if you were given enough information, you could do that just by running the first law, right? And that's why I always strongly encourage students to go back in any kind of open system problem that we have and write down this basic version of the first law. Because then I can ask you any question, right? And it doesn't have to have the answer of, oh, W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out, or Q dot is equal to M dot times H out minus H in. Doesn't matter what question I ask you, 
because you'll just look at what you know, what terms you can keep and what terms you can neglect, and you'll get an answer that makes sense, right? You have the opportunity to demonstrate your understanding when you start from the most basic version of the first law, right? And on an exam, your job as a student is to demonstrate your understanding. So I think it's a really good process, right? Usually, but not always, right? For these four component Rankine cycles, these are the equations that we're going to get, right? That if you have a turbine or a pump, the power is gonna be M dot times H in minus H out. I'm gonna let the first law worry about the sign, right? But I know physically what it means. If I have a positive power, that means I'm producing power, like in a turbine. But if I have a negative power, that's like a pump where I'm consuming power. The trick here is that if I'm trying to find the net power, right, which is the numerator of my thermal efficiency, I add those two things together, right? I don't subtract them. So one of the things you should always check is, is your net power less than your turbine power? Because if you take turbine power minus pump power, and pump power is negative, then you'll get a net power bigger than your turbine power. And that's an indication that you messed up, right? Um, for the thermal efficiency, we don't care what the condenser heat rate is here, right? So we don't need that for thermal efficiency, right? But for the boiler, well, we need this heat because our denominator of thermal efficiency is what's the heat that's going in, right? And the beauty of this is that it doesn't matter what cycle we're talking about. As long as it's an open system, we'll get equations that have this kind of shape, right? Maybe you have a turbine that has heat loss, right? So maybe there's a Q dot term over here, right? But it's still gonna have that same kind of shape where you know W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out and there's some other stuff, right? Or maybe it's got two outlets, like the very first turbine that we looked at when we were talking about open systems, but it's still generally the enthalpy at the inlet minus the enthalpy at the outlet, right? Even if it's a little bit more complex, it's the same process. And again, that's why you start with the first law. Because otherwise, you just have to memorize too many things. You know, oh, in this subcase, then this is what the equation is gonna look like. Or in this case, then this is what the equation is gonna look like. And I don't know about you, but the reason that I want, like, I talked a little bit about my background, um, maybe in the first class, but when I was a high school student, I, uh, I worked in a biomedical lab doing like intestinal disease research. Uh, I won this contest or whatever, right? And that was part of the reason why I decided to go into uh, engineering. <laughs> because um, first of all, my job was mostly pipetting stuff from like one, you know, container into another container. Um, secondly, there were some things that I had to do with mice that I didn't want to do for the rest of my life. And uh, thirdly, in science, especially in, my brother's a biochemist, right? And to me, it seemed like for biology, there was just so many things that you had to memorize. And, and I prefer to understand things instead of memorizing things. And maybe I could have got to that level in something like biology where, um, where I could have understood things enough that I didn't have to memorize things. But I think for a class like thermodynamics, your life will be much easier if you start from the basics, understand how to get to these equations, and then it doesn't matter what problem I ask you because you just walk through the same process every time, right? You're gonna get these equations, especially for the symbolic part, right? Then you get to this point where you have to ask, what's the fluid, right? In a Rankine cycle, the fluid is always going to be water or something like it, something that we boil and condense. That's what makes a Rankine cycle a Rankine cycle is that we're using heat to boil something, right? Now we did an example problem before where we looked at this Rankine cycle, right? And we were supposed to find the thermal efficiency. And we got this answer, right? So that means for every 100 kilowatts of heat rate we put in, we got 28.4 kilowatts of power out, right? And maybe that's a little bit depressing, right? Certainly on an exam, um, you're hoping to get more than 28.4%, right? So when we look at this, even though the second law, Calvin and Planck would probably tell us if we looked at the temperatures 
Um, we can't get up to 100%, right? But 28.4 is still kind of low, right? So maybe we have this question of, can we improve our thermal efficiency, right? For, so for this particular problem, right, the, the efficiency we got in this real system where we had turbines and pumps that had particular efficiencies, we got to um, thermal efficiencies of 28.4%. But if we just did the Carnot efficiency, right, that's the maximum efficiency, right, then we could see that, well, we could get as high as 55.3%, right? So there's room to improve, right? So today, we're going to start talking about how we can be improving the efficiency of Rankin cycles. Maybe I'll give you a second if you want to read the comic here. Right, so... The first question maybe that we should always be asking in any class that we take is, well, well why is this important, right? Um, so I think there's two reasons why improving thermal efficiency is important. And the first is an economic reason. So if I'm working for a company that produces power and I can produce this more power with the same inputs, well, that means that I can generate more profit. Right? Or I'm, I'm producing more with the same input. Right? So that's good. I, you know, if I'm going to my boss and I'm saying we should improve thermal efficiency, this is a nice um, argument to make because I think especially the higher up you go in a company, you know, the numbers they care about the most are the numbers that have dollar signs in front of them. Right? So, you, you know, as engineers, a lot of times we're kind of straddling this line between sort of advocating for societal benefit but also having to speak the language of companies, which oftentimes is interested in maximizing profit, right? So there is a profit maximization argument here, but the other argument for improving thermal efficiency, right, is that, um, you know, Earth's a pretty good place to live and we don't have any other options, right? So we would like to generate some power with less environmental impact. Right? And one of the ways we can do that is by improving thermal efficiency. If we, you know, say, well, at least in the short term, we still have to be burning fossil fuels. Let's try to burn as little fossil fuels as we can. In this case, we're talking about coal power plants. Let's burn as little coal as we can and produce as much power as we can. Right? Or if you're looking at nuclear plants, right, and you're worried about nuclear plants are great because they, um, they don't emit CO2, right? But there's some downside effects in, in the fringe cases that are really bad, right? So, you know, if we can have fewer nuclear power plants, then we have fewer bad events associated with nuclear reactors, probably, right? So there's a couple things that we can look at, even from simple models, right? Now, one of the things that I think I said at the beginning of the class is that the job of the engineer oftentimes in real life is to try to either design something or improve something, even though we don't have a perfect understanding of the physical world, right? Or of the universe, right? So we have to make these models, right? And remember, every time we make an assumption, right? Our, that model of the universe that we have looks more and more like a cartoon, right? Less and less like the real world. So for this ideal heat engine, we made tons of assumptions. Right? So this is pretty, you know, cartoonish, but it's still useful, right? And that's the job of the engineer is to sort of derive benefit from even these simple models. Because I can look at this equation and I can right off the bat tell you two things you can, do, you can do to improve efficiency. Or at least to improve the maximum efficiency that you could get in a particular system. Right? What this equation tells me is that the, because these are absolute temperatures, so the maximum efficiency that you could ever get is 100%. Right? But Calvin and Planck tell us we can't even do that, right? Because we have to cool our engine off. But this is 1 minus T hot or T cold over T hot, right? So the second term here is taking away from our efficiency. So I want to make that term as small as I can. If I increase T hot, if the denominator there gets really, really, really big, then that negative term gets small, right? Or if I reduced the cold temperature, 
then my numerator gets really small and that term gets really, really small, right? So even from this simple model, there's two things that I can do to practically improve how these systems work, right? So there's a couple things we can do to increase T hot, right? Now, we want steam going through our turbine. So let's say we were in a case where we were boiling the water only up until the point where we had saturated vapor going into the turbine, right? So there's no more liquid. Now, what would happen if we increased the hot temperature or the hottest temperature in our cycle, right? We would, if we kept the pressure the same anyway, we would increase the temperature by heating up the water even past the point where all the liquid water had boiled, right? So if we kept adding heat, right? then we would move into the superheated vapor region, right? So we can add superheat to our cycle, or we can superheat our cycle so that we have more enthalpy as we start going into the turbine, right? There's a couple of things that this does, right? And the first, obviously, is that it's increasing the heat that we have to put into the system, right? And that's kind of a bad thing because if we think about our thermal efficiency, it's the net power over the heat rate in. So we better be, we're increasing the heat rate in, that's our denominator, but we want our thermal efficiency to be higher. So we better be increasing our net power faster than we're increasing our heat in, right? And it turns out with this particular strategy, that's what happens, right? So this is a good strategy. If we superheat our fluid, we go beyond that saturated vapor right, into the superheated vapor region as we go into our, um, our turbine, that increases our thermal efficiency. So that's one strategy we have, right, increase T-hot. Now for this, we maybe want to be friends with uh, chemical engineers, right, because we need some kind of fuel that's going to burn hotter than whatever the boiling temperature of our water is, right. So there's some limitations on this, right, because you, you can't have an infinitely high temperature. Well, technically you can, I guess. Right? It's not like absolute zero where there's a bottom, right? But, but in practice, you know, you're transferring heat from something hot into the water. So that hot thing has to be hot enough to get you past this superheated vapor, right? Um, you could go super critical. That's another way to increase your high temperature, right? And that's you're increasing your pressure high enough so you never even go through the vapor door, right? So here, yeah, you have to put a little more power in to get up to that pressure. But remember, the pump pressure tends to be really low for these Rankine cycles. That's one of the benefits, right? Low backwork ratios doesn't take that much power to increase the pressure of a liquid. Right? Then we heat up, <coughs> and then we go through our turbine. But here, we're going through at a much higher temperature because we're at this super critical temperature and pressure. So we're above that. Remember, that critical point is the maximum temperature and pressure at which water can exist at equilibrium between liquid and vapor when you're, when you're at equilibrium. So yeah, you're increasing your pump and you're increasing your heat in. Both those things are kind of bad, but you make it up on the turbine power that you get. So again, your net power is increasing because you're putting out power, the, the increase in the turbine power is bigger than the increase in the pump power, right? And again, you're increasing your net power faster than you're increasing your heat rate in, right? So that's increasing our thermal efficiency. But again, there's limits on this. You want to be friends, like I said, with uh, chemical engineers so you can burn stuff hot enough. With materials engineers, which is also sort of part of mechanical engineering, sort of part of chemical engineering. We talked about how um, mechanical engineering is this very diverse degree where um, there's all kinds of facets. So if you find yourself not liking thermodynamics, that's okay. There's uh, lots of other things you can study in mechanical engineering, right? You want to make turbines where the steel doesn't melt at this high temperature, right? So you need to be friends with materials engineers too because there's a limit because, you know, even if you have a fuel that burns hot enough, if it melts your turbine, it's not so good for your um, thermal efficiency. Not so good for your power plant if the turbine melts, right? The, if those blades fail. So that's two things we can do to increase 
the hot temperature, right? We can superheat the fluid or we can go super critical, right? But what about reducing the cold temperature? Right? So one of the things we can do by reducing the cold temperature, you can see here, our low temperature here is under the vapor dome. So the way that we reduce the cold temperature is we reduce the pressure of our condenser below something easy like atmospheric pressure. So if we run our condenser at a low pressure, then what happens is, again, we increase our net power faster than we increase the heat rate in, right? So this increases our thermal efficiency. So just from that sort of simple model saying that, oh, thermal efficiency is one minus T cold over T hot, we have three strategies to make our, our heat engine better, right? We can increase T hot by going super critical. We can increase T hot by having a superheated vapor going into our turbine, or we can reduce T cold by dropping the pressure inside of our condenser. All right, so we'll go through an example looking at how we can how the efficiency improves when we um in this case i think this is talking about a um, superheated vapor in the turbine so this will be the first of our three examples today here it says your super supervisor asks you if you think it would be a good idea to superheat the fluid coming out of the boiler into the coal-fired power plant. There are two possible states for the output of the boiler, 1A and 1B, right? So going into the turbine, you could be at the, it must be saturated vapor in the first case, right? And superheated vapor in the second case. Now, if the turbine and the pump are ideal, what's the difference in the thermal efficiency of the power plant right so the first thing that we want to do here is draw a ts diagram so technically on the exam right we won't have this idea of talking about improving efficiency using um superheat or um or supercritical or by dropping the pressure in the condenser but you could still get a problem kind of like this, right? Where you got either 1A going into the turbine or 1B going into the turbine. And I would expect you to be able to solve that problem, right? So the first thing it asks us to do is draw a TS diagram for both cases. When I'm drawing a TS diagram, there's a couple things that I always want to do first. Right? First, I got to label my axes T and S. Then I ask myself, what's the fluid? Because this is a Rankin cycle, the fluid is water in this case, or at least something like water, so that um, we have a vapor dome on our diagram. The next thing that I want to do is ask myself, how many pressures are involved in the system? Now, in this case, they show me this. I can look, there's one high pressure and one low pressure. But the thing I always like to do is say, find the max between the number of turbines and the number of pumps. In that case, this is one, right? And then I take this number and I add one. So that gives me two, right? So I have one low pressure and one high pressure. I remember that constant pressure lines on a TS diagram look the same as constant pressure lines on a uh, TV diagram where as the pressure goes up, this line slides up. And as I move left to right, I'm going up and to the right, unless I'm under the vapor dome where um, I'm flat. Right now, these are just sketches, right? So they don't have to be perfect. Don't worry if, the, if your sketches on, uh, on your exam are not perfect, right? The job is just to, exp to demonstrate your understanding generally of these um, cases, right? So in case A, State one is here at the saturated vapor line. 
And because it's an ideal turbine, remember if I, if I did my ideal turbine, the second law, ds by dt, is equal to q dot over t of the surroundings plus the sum of m dot in s in minus the sum of m dot out s out plus sigma dot. Now, because this is ideal, sigma dot goes to zero. In this class, we're always going to say that it's steady state. Because it's a turbine, this is zero, right? And this turbine also only has one inlet and one outlet. What that tells me is that zero is equal to m dot in s in minus m dot out s out. And if I did conservation of mass, that'd be dm by dt is equal to the sum of m dot in oops, minus the sum of, oops, we're wrong color, m dot out, right? And we've said for this turbine where it's steady state one inlet and one outlet, that tells me that m dot in is equal to m dot out. And in fact, because at least when I'm talking about the hot side here going around, m dot one is equal to m dot two, but the same is true, true for the condenser as I go from two to three, right? And the pump from three to four, because these are all in series, I know that m dot one is equal to m dot two, which is equal to m dot three, which is equal to m dot four, I'm just going to call that m dot or in the last problem where we had cold water going through the system I called this m dot hot because it was the mass flow rate going through my Reagan cycle right where m dot cold was this cooling water but in this problem there is no cooling water right so here if I go back to my second law analysis right this means that m dot times s in minus s out is equal to zero there's two ways this can happen there's like the super boring answer where there's no fluid going through my Rankine cycle. So it's just off, right? M dot would be equal to zero. But that's, like I said, kind of boring. We probably wouldn't be analyzing that system, right? So here, delta S for this ideal turbine is equal to zero. So it's isentropic. So I have this vertical line down as I go from state one to state two S. I guess I would call this 1A and 2AS. It gets a little bit cumbersome, right? And then as I go to state three, this is a saturated liquid, sorry. Right, so here I'm gonna move over here to this saturated liquid at state three. And then I'm gonna go through this ideal pump. An ideal pump also has delta S equal to zero. So I have this vertical line up here, this is state 4S, and then I come through this turbine. So this is my cycle in case A. I like to, you don't have to do this on an exam, but I like to remind myself what's going on. There's turbine being produced, so I draw an arrow coming out of my cycle in the turbine. There's power being consumed in the pump. There's heat rate coming in in the boiler, and there's heat rate going out in the condenser. Now, what about in the super heated case? The other states are all this, well, at least the left-hand side here, the pump is still the same pump. But if I'm going in at 1B, right, then I'm superheated. I'm still gonna assume that uh, 2BS, at least when I'm drawing this, I'm gonna assume that this is still two phase. I knew it had to be two phase in this case, because if I go straight down from this line, I have to be under the vapor dome. I could, if I superheated it all the way up to here, I, I, you know, you'd see that we'd be superheated coming out of the turbine too. But here I'm gonna assume that we're still two phase. We'll check that as we go through, right? And then I cool all the way down still to the subcooled liquid at state three. I have my ideal pump at 4S, and then I add heat to get back to the inlet. So still, conceptually, this looks the same. Q dot in, Q dot out, 
power from the turbine coming out, power from the pump going in. Right? So that's how we draw our TS diagrams for these four component cycles. They're always going to look kind of the same, right? But the placements of state one and state two might be a little bit different. Right? But generally, if you could do like, so let's say we had a problem and it was really a superheated vapor, but on the exam you drew it like this. I'm okay with that on an exam because you usually this will be the first question and you won't necessarily know exactly where to put these points, right? So you just want to generally show that you know what's going on. Right? I'm also a big fan of having colored pencils in your exams, right? Because I think it makes, as these diagrams get more and more complicated, it makes it a little easier to do this, right? So we did part one. Now I'm going to do, this is actually, if when you do exams, if you end up running out of time, I would go for symbolic solutions first. Because I think with the symbolic solutions, you get more bang for your buck, right? You can demonstrate your understanding pretty quickly with the symbolic solutions. It's in this class, it tends to be fixing the states that takes a long time, right? So here, I'm gonna start by getting symbolic solutions for all three of these parts, right? So, you know, um, if I'm looking for my turbine power over my mass flow rate of the turbine, this is code for I got to do the first law. It's also, if you're doing um, a thermodynamics problem and you feel stuck, right? And it's an open system problem, do conservation of mass if you haven't done it, do conservation of energy if you haven't done it, and you can do the second law if you haven't done it, right? So that at least symbolically, you can show that you know what you're doing for that problem. Even if you really, when you read the question, felt like you had no idea what was going on, right? So here I know the first law is dE by dt is equal to Q dot minus W dot plus the sum of M dot in H in plus V in squared over two GC, because this is an imperial problem, right? It's in feet and pounds and stuff right? Plus G over GC times the elevation at the inlet minus the sum of M dot out, H out, plus V out squared over 2 GC plus G over GC C out. For all my components, I'm going to say that they're steady state, so this goes away. I'm going to say that they're all one in, one out. So these summation signs go away, get replaced with ones. I'm going to say that I can neglect changes in kinetic energy and changes in potential energy. This doesn't necessarily mean that these things are zero, just that they're really a lot smaller than things like power or heat rate for the components that I'm interested in. Then for my turbine and my pump, I'm going to say that they're adiabatic. So that Q dot is equal to zero. So for my turbine and my pump, Q dot is equal to zero. But for my boiler, right? And um, I guess the hot side of my condenser, which we're going to see that I don't actually need for this problem. Uh, this is not going to be Q dot is equal to zero. I'm going to say that there's no fan blades inside these particular components. So W dot goes to zero. So this is going to be true for the boiler and for the condenser, at least on the hot side. Although we saw in that last problem that we did last class, that if I wanted to find like a cooling mass flow rate, I could do the first law on the whole condenser, the hot side and the cold side, and I can get a ratio of mass flow rates. We'll talk about mass flow rates again as we get to the end of today's lecture. But now from this, I can see if I'm looking for my turbine power, this is going to be M dot H in minus H out. I've already established that all the mass flow rates are the same. So I'm just going to call it M dot. Right now it wants my, so here the inlet, when I look at this diagram, Inlet of the turbine is state one. 
The outlet is state 2. So this is going to be m dot times h1 minus h2. I also think, right, when I drew my diagram here, my power was going out of the system. I know that work in is negative, right, when work out must be positive. So I'm expecting turbine power should be positive because it's power that's produced, right? So h1 I'm expecting will be bigger than h2. This problem, though, doesn't want the power it wants the turbine power divided by the mass flow rate, which is going to be H1 minus H2. Here's my symbolic solution for part A. And I think it wants this for both parts. Right? So here I would have W dot T A over M dot is going to be equal to H1 A minus H2 A. And W dot T in case B over M dot is going to be H1B minus H2B. Right. Now, there's some bad news here, right? Although I guess there's some good news because they told me uh, H1A and H1B. So I know both of these values, but I don't know these two things. So I see this is kind of what happens in thermodynamics is we're trying to get to equations where if I fixed all the states, then I'd get numerical answers. But let's say this is an exam and I'm trying to maximize my points per minute, which is kind of the game you're playing when you write an exam, right? Because it's a timed experience. So I'm gonna go through and get all of my symbolic solutions first, because then I don't get like, I think maybe I said this um, previously, but it's a little bit heartbreaking when I'm grading an exam and I get to the last page and it's blank, right? But if you go through, if, if you find that happens to you sometimes on exams, my advice would be try to go through and do everything symbolically first. Because it's a lot easier to get, say, the first 50% of each part of the problem than the second 50%, right? If you're already at 75% of the points for part A, you know, it gets harder and harder to get the next point. Right? Whereas if on part E it's blank, it's pretty easy to get the first half of the points on part E. Right? So I'm going to get symbolic solutions. The next thing is thermal efficiency. Again, in both cases. I know that my thermal efficiency is the energy benefit divided by the energy cost. Because this is a heat engine, this is net power divided by heat rate in. I like to bust out my colored pencils here and say this is going to be the turbine power, which is positive, plus my pump power. Oh, I don't know why the turbine power changed color there. Plus my pump power, which is negative, divided by my heat rate at the boiler, which is also positive. But now I did the first law for the turbine. The pumps are going to be the same, right? So this is going to be m dot turbine was h in minus h out so h1 minus h2 the pump is again h in minus h out because the first law on the pump looks exactly like it does on the on the turbine so this is h in is state three h out is state four i'll get that better as we move down the boiler, though, is m dot times h out minus h in, right? Because here, for the boiler, I'm going to get 0 is equal to q dot plus m dot times h in minus h out. But because I'm solving for q dot, I move this to the other side. So I have to multiply it by negative 1. So I can say h out minus h in. So this is going to be H out of the boiler, which is state 1, minus H into the boiler, which is state 4. Again, I want to do this in two different cases. So for case A, this is going to be... Oh, the other thing too, because all these mass flow rates are the same, the M dots all drop out. So here, they didn't tell me the mass flow rate, I don't think. 
but I don't need it if I'm just trying to find thermal efficiency or power per unit mass flowing through the system. So this is going to be thermal efficiency in A is going to be H1A minus H2A plus H3A minus H4A. Oh, these are all the same, though. 3 and 4, I don't need the subscripts A because it's only 1 and 2 that change. Um, and this is going to be H1A minus H4, which is the same, right? And thermal efficiency in part B is going to be H1B minus H2B plus H3 minus H4 divided by H1B minus H4. I like to do some counting here. I think we have H, uh, the H1s. We don't have the state 2s. I think we have, I think it's that they gave us the odd numbered ones, but not the even numbered ones. Right? We know H3, but we don't know H4. Um, the bad news is that state 1 and 2 are different in my two different cases. The good news is that state three and four are the same in my two cases. So that's symbolic answers for um, part C. Right now for part D, we want this other way that we can characterize the system, which is by the back work ratio. This is an acknowledgement that the power plant is the first consumer of the power from the power plant, right? So there's pumps that are running in our coal-fired power plant, right? And you've got to plug those pumps into the wall. They're taking power off the grid, and the turbine's producing that power, right? So this is going to be how much of my pump power goes into my turbine, right? Now, this, my pump power, I put absolute values here, right? Because the pump power is negative, the turbine power is positive, but the backward ratio is always a positive number. Right, so this is going to be, we know that my pump power is M dot times H3 minus H4, inlet minus outlet. The turbine power is H1 minus H2, also inlet minus outlet. These mass flow rates drop out. And I'm going to get H3 minus H4 divided by H1 minus H2, right? Or I, again... I'm going to have two different versions of this, H1A, H2A, right? And the back work ratio in part B is going to be H3 minus H4. That's the same, divided by H1B minus H2B. Again, I know the odd-numbered states, but not the even-numbered states. So does the symbolic solution part make sense? Hopefully yes. Now we can go about fixing the states. State one, we know there's two different options for state one. Maybe I can pull my state table down here. I think in the interest of time, oops. I'm going to show you how to find the states, but we won't do it numerically, just so that we make sure we get through the other parts of the problem. So H1, A, here we know the pressure and the quality. So we know P1A is equal to 1800 PSI. And uh, X1A is equal to 1. We don't even have to fix this state though, right? We could if, we, if this pressure table here that I snipped out 
went all the way up to 1800 PSI, which it does in the textbook. But I actually don't care because they told me H1A is equal to 1150.4, right? And H1B, this is going to be superheated, right? But they also told me that this is 1,602, oops, point nine. These are BTU per pound mass. Okay. Now, how do I go about fixing state 2A and 2B? I gotta ask myself, right? So the first thing is that these are ideal oops, turbines. And we've already established that that means delta S is equal to zero because of all the other assumptions that we made, right? When we were drawing our TS diagrams, we drew these as vertical lines down. So that means that S2A is equal to S1A, which in this case is equal to 1.306 BTU per pound mass Rankin. And S2B is equal to S1B, which is equal to 1.6534, 1.6534, same units, BTU per pound mass Rankin. So the question I want to ask myself is, is it two-phase? If it's two-phase, then SF will be less than S2, A or B, which would be less than SG. We're doing this in both cases at one PSI. That's here. So if I look at one PSI in this case, SF is 0 0.13, I'm going to say 3, right? And SG is 1.98, same units, BTU per pound mass degree rank. In both cases, right, this is like S2A and S2B. So S2B is bigger than S2A, but they're both in this range, right? So that means I can find my quality X2A is going to be S2A minus SF divided by SG minus SF. In this case, that's 1.306 minus 1.98 divided by, oops, should be SF here, not SG. So minus 0 0.133 divided by 1.98 minus 0 0.133. I can put that into my calculator and see that I get 1.306 minus 0 0.133 divided by, in parentheses, 1.98 minus 0.133. The number that I got here was 0.635. That allows me to find H2A, which is going to be HF plus X2A times HFG or HG minus HF if I wanted to work it all out, right? So HF here, right, is 69.74. These are all in BTU per pound mass, plus X2A, which is 0 0.635, times HFG, I'm going to take the middle number here, 1,036, And the number that I'm going to get is, I'll take 1,036 times 0 0.635 plus 69.74. And that's going to be 727.6. 
BTU per pound mass Rankin. I can do the exact same process for um, 2B, right? So I'm going to say X2B is going to be equal to, it's still in between there, right? But 1.6534 minus 0 0.133 divided by 1.98 minus 0 0.133. If you ever get an X value bigger than one, it means you're not two phase, All right? So here, there's gonna be 1.653 minus 0 0.133 divided by 1.98 minus 0 0.133. This is about 83%. I'm gonna have H2B is also going to be HF plus X2B HFG, right? This is going to be 0.83 times 1,036 plus 69.74, BTU per pound mass. Oops, just pound mass, not pound mass degree rank. So when I go back to all my other equations, right? Now let's just focus on the thermal efficiency. Maybe we'll get numerical answers for the thermal efficiency. Now I know H2A and H2B. If I knew H4, then I'd be able to fix to fix this. I'd be done, right? I could find the thermal efficiency. So what do I do here? How do I find state four? State three, it's nice it's given to me, right? Um, they just gave it to me here. But if they didn't, then I would just look it up, right? Because it's one PSI and it's a quality of zero. So it's 0 0.69. Seven four. It looks like a transcription error here. So six nine point. So H three is equal to sixty nine point seven BTU per pound mass. Now, what do I do as I go from right? So this is an ideal pump. We'll pretend that I know how to spell, right? And when I'm thinking about these problems, first I gotta ask myself, what's the fluid? Oh, it's water. And then there used to only be three options here. Oh, is it uh, a subcooled liquid? Or is it a two-phase mixture? Or is it a superheated vapor? But now I have this extra answer. Is it an ideal pump? Because if it's an ideal pump, delta H is equal to approximately the specific volume times the change in pressure because it's an incompressible liquid and it's an ideal pump. If you write down this equation here, make sure you tell me that this is true because it's an ideal pump. So um, this is the same in both cases, right? But delta H, it doesn't really matter if I call this in minus out or out minus in. Right? But because I, um, when I did the first law here, I was talking always H in minus H out. So I'll call this H3 minus H4S is equal to the specific volume. It doesn't matter which specific volume I pick, but I already know the specific volume at state three times P, the delta P has to go in the same order as the delta H. So this is going to be P3 minus P4S. I'm expecting this value to be negative. It's a couple of things. One of the reasons that I picked an imperial problem for this is because the units here are a pain, even in metric. If this was metric, I would say, make sure your pressure is in kilopascals, right? But here, my specific volume, VF, is about 0 0.016. 0 0.016, that's going to be in 
It's specific volume, so it's feet cubed per pound mass. My pressure difference, P3, is going to be 1 PSI minus P4 is much higher, 1800 PSI. And this is in pounds force per inches squared. But I see a problem here already, right? Because I got inch, feet cubed on the top and inches squared on the bottom here. Right? So I'm going to multiply this by 12, inch, 12 squared inches squared per foot squared. Now the inches are going to cancel. My, I'm going to get... Okay, so I'm going to do the math here. See what I get. Right? This is going to be... One minus 1,800. This is good. It's a negative number, which is what I want, times 0 0.016 times 12 squared. All right, so here I got negative 4,144.8. But this is in foot pounds force per pound mass. That's good because it's energy per unit mass. But I want to turn this into BTU. So 1 BTU is equal to 778 foot pounds force. That's going to cancel. So I take this number, which looks really big, and I'm going to divide it by 778. So minus 4144.8 divided by 778. And that's going to be minus 5.33. BTU per pound mass, right? So H4S, right? So if I'm trying to solve for H4S, is going to be H3 plus 5.33 BTU per pound mass. H3 was 69.7, so I add 5.33, so 69.7 plus... 5.33, and I get 75 BTU per pound mass. Right, so thermal efficiency in case A was going to be H1A minus H2A plus H3A minus H4A divided by H1A minus H4A. Right? And thermal efficiency of part B is going to be H1B minus H2B plus H3. Well, H3 and H4, they're just the same. They don't really, we don't really care about A's and B's here. H3 minus H4 divided by H1B minus H4. So if I put all this together, my H4 is going to be 75. My H3 is going to be 69.7. All of these values are in BTU per pound mass. I already checked that out. So it's, I'm going to get a number that has no units. BTU divided by uh, BTU per pound mass over BTU per pound mass. 1A is 1150 point four. Two A is seven twenty seven point six. One A is eleven fifty point four. Here, if I can put these numbers into my calculator correctly, which I'm good at fat fingering my calculator, so I like to sort of break these things up if I'm doing it on an exam. But here, I'm going to roll the dice here, try to do it all in one shot. Eleven fifty point four minus seven twenty seven point six plus. 69.7 minus 75 divided by, in parentheses, 1150.4 minus 75. 0 0.388. It's good. It's a dimensionless number. It's lower than 1, so it's possible. 
right? I didn't figure out the Carnot efficiency, but this should be less than one minus T hot over T or T cold over T hot, right? These are, this is almost the same thing, right? Um, it's still going to be plus 69.7 minus 75 divided by, this is still gonna be minus 75, but uh, one B and two B are different. One B is 1602.9, minus 929.6 1602.9 equals again I'm going to roll the dice here 1602.9 minus 929.6 plus 69.7 plus 60 9.7 minus 75 divided by in parentheses 1602.9 minus 75 and I got an answer here of 0 0.482 so in this case superheating the vapor going into the turbine improved our thermal efficiency by almost 10 percent right and like we said there's a financial advantage to that but there's also an environmental advantage to that so one of the ways that we can improve the thermal efficiency of a rankin cycle is by superheating the fluid so i know that was kind of a long example and i wouldn't ask you to do all of this on the midterm but you certainly could get a Rankin cycle problem on the midterm. And you would have to be able to fix at least, to know how to fix any one of these states, although you might not have to fix all four, right? And then get to an answer, something like thermal efficiency. Does anybody have questions about the example we just did? All right, let's take five minutes. Uh, we'll come back at 7.44. Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome back. I just noticed that I um, failed to record or screen grab the reheat portion of the lecture. So if you're following along with these three hour videos on YouTube, um, you have to go back and and look at the one hour version of that reheat lecture. So the next thing we're going to learn about is certainly the most complicated of the Rankin cycles and arguably the most complicated cycle that we're going to look at in the whole class <clears throat> so this is improving rankin efficiency so improving the reheat of rankin cycles using what we call regeneration so like i said when we look at this thermal efficiency equation and it's net power over heat rate in I think of doing reheat as increasing the net power because we added a second turbine. Now, of course, power and heat in are both changing, right? Um, but when we think about decreasing the required heat rate in, I think about regeneration, which is the next thing we're going to learn. Now, maybe just to prime your brains a little bit, um, I'll tell you about when i lived in canada so just before we moved here my wife and i we bought a brand new home so we were the first people to live there and it was an energy star certified home so we paid a little bit more money to have um basically a more efficient home and one of the ways they do that is by really making the home so it's very close to being airtight. So it's hard for cold air to leak in in the winter or hot air to leak in in the summer, right? But the problem with that or the potential problem with that is that um, you don't want stale air in your house all the time, right? So we had what was called an HRV system which I think was a heat recovery ventilation system, 
if I remember correctly, if I remember both the acronym and what it stands for correctly. Basically what it would do, let's think about the summer because that's what we're in now. We're paying all this money to keep the air in the house cold. But every once in a while, we want to bring hot air in from the outside. So what we would do is there would be a heat exchanger in the house and we would be taking hot air in from the outside and expelling some cold air from the inside and these streams of air would pass over each other and the hot air would lose some heat to that cold air so we were pre-cooling the air when it came into the house right and then that exhaust gas that we were putting out right would be a little bit warmer when it left the house and in the winter the opposite happens right where we're still taking air from the inside but now that's hot and air, we're bringing in air from the outside which is cold they pass in this same heat exchanger and now the hot air in the house is preheating the air that we're bringing in from the outside so in both of those cases in the in the summer it means we run the air conditioner a little bit less because we're using the cold air that we're getting rid of to pre-cool the, the hot air that's coming in and in the winter we run the furnace a little bit less because what we're doing is we're preheating the air before it comes into the house and it's that same sort of idea that we're going to use in these regeneration cycles essentially we're going to use some heat that we've already paid for to try to preheat the fluid before it goes into the main place where we add heat right before it goes into that boiler so here's what a regeneration cycle might look like. One option for a regeneration cycle. Just like reheat, we have two turbines. Now what makes this potentially the most difficult of the problems we'll do in the whole class is that between these two turbines, we have a node, right? And in this node, some of the mass flow rate gets diverted right in the notation of the textbook this is y percent of the mass flow rate right y is usually some number that's less than i don't know a quarter of the mass flow rate it should be some smaller percentage of the mass flow rate most of the mass flow rate goes through this second turbine this lower pressure turbine but some of the mass flow rate gets diverted here right so that's the main thing that makes regeneration so we already so for this mass flow rate that we're diverting we took a bunch of the power out of this mass flow rate when we went through that first turbine there's still some power we could take out of this by reducing the enthalpy even more through the second turbine but instead we'll divert the mass flow rate this is like this hot mass flow rate Right? Because as we move through the turbine, not only does the pressure go down, but the temperature comes down too. Right? Now the rest of the mass, the undiverted mass flow rate, or 1 minus y times the mass flow rate, goes through my second turbine. Right? And it gets condensed, just like it normally would, through this pump to this intermediate pressure. This same pressure that was in between these two turbines. But now, this is like that... Um, Remember I told you for these open um, heat exchangers, right? This is like, uh, you know, my grandfather's sink, right? So there's a hot tap and a cold tap, and there's some hot water coming into the basin and some cold water coming into the basin. Maybe your bathtub is like this too, right? And it mixes together to make some warm water in the basin, right? Or in the bathtub, right? Now, that's what happens here, is there's this hotter fluid, this higher enthalpy fluid that we scavenged or that we bled off from in between our two turbines and it's going to preheat this fluid that went through the condenser in this other pump so it heats it up to higher than it normally would be if we didn't do this regeneration right all the mass gets back together at this open feed water heater and comes through right and then it all goes through the steam generator but before it gets to the steam generator, it's kind of been preheated, right? 
Now, you don't get this for free, right? This is a little bit like, um, I don't know, maybe you've run like a, like a 5K before, or maybe you went to some kind of summer camp and you got a t-shirt and it was like, oh, you get this free t-shirt. But it's not a free t-shirt. It's a t-shirt whose price is included in whatever registration price you paid to enter into that event, right? Same thing here. We're not getting this heat for free. We already paid for it when we heated up all the fluid in this steam generator. But we're diverting some of the mass flow right here. The price of that is that we don't get to get more power from that mass flow rate as it goes through this turbine. The benefit of it is we get to use that hot fluid to heat up this fluid before it goes into the steam generator so we add less heat when we go through the steam generator again. So really what's happening here is we end up reducing the amount of heat that we put into the system versus the case where we weren't doing the regeneration and all the mass went through both turbines and the condenser. Right? Another way of thinking about this is that because we have less mass flow rate going through the condenser, we're losing less heat. And because we lose less heat, right? Remember, the heat that goes in, it either comes out as net work or it goes out as waste heat or cooling the system, right? So if less of our heat is going out, well, that must mean that we're getting more work for the same amount of heat in. Right. And that's what happens in these regeneration systems. So we're reducing the heat that goes in at the boiler. That's good, right? Because our thermal efficiency is net work divided by heat rate in. Right? The textbook talks about this. We're increasing the average temperature of heat addition. Right? They always say when that happens, you're increasing your thermal efficiency. Because our heat, or the enthalpy that's at state 7 here, is higher than it otherwise would be. Right? And we're also re reducing the amount of heat that gets rejected in this condenser. Right? So regeneration is a benefit. It improves our efficiency. If you went into a real-life nuclear or coal power plant, it would be doing regeneration and it would be doing reheat. It would be much more complicated than any of the cycles that we talk about in the class. Right? But when we do the analysis, even though this system is the most complicated one, break it down. Don't think about it as, oh my, I'm going to need like some kind of divine intervention to be able to find the answer to this problem because it's so complicated. Instead, look at this problem and say, it's okay, I don't know how to do this problem right now, but I know the process. And if I follow the same process I did for all the other Rankin cycles, I'm going to be okay. Right? Um, so regeneration works. It improves thermal efficiency, right? So it's approved by the Lorax, right? It's good for the environment, right? It's also good for the bottom line because it means we get more power out for the same heat we put in. Now, there's more than one kind of way we can do regeneration, right? Usually this is classified by the type of what they call feed water heater, the type of heat exchanger that we're using to preheat the fluid before it goes into the boiler, right? So the, in the first thing that we talked about is this open feed water heater where the mass actually comes together in the same thing, right? This is like the bathtub or my grandfather's sink where you're directly mixing the streams together, right? But you could have a closed feed water heater. This is like, say, the radiator in your automobile, right? And here, the streams don't mix, right? So here, they have to be at the same pressure to come together, right? That's why we have two pumps, because we have we needed to get this fluid out of the condenser up to this intermediate pressure so that we don't have um, backflow here, so that the flow all goes the direction that we want it to go, right? But here, you don't necessarily need that um, because these fluids never come in contact with each other, right? That's like um, 
you know, across this radiator, they're transferring heat, but they're not um, mixing the mass, right? And again, in a real power plant, they're going to be using open feed water heaters and closed feed water heaters, right? And again, when you think about this as we're going to do first laws on all these different components, then the process is the same, but the answer is definitely different, right? So this is the real, you know, I've said a couple of times, I encourage people to bring um, colored pencils to exams. This in particular is the cycle where I think it's very helpful to have colored pencils with you, right? Because then you can make it very clear what mass flow rate goes to which port on which component, right? So in the open feed water heater, like we talked about, this diverted mass, you know, the mass flow rate gets diverted between these two turbines, and it only goes into the inlet of this open feed water heater. But in the closed feed water heater system, you're still diverting mass in between these two turbines, but it goes through one side of this closed feed water heater. This trap, this is just a valve. Remember we talked about um, valves before. The enthalpy stays the same from state seven to state eight, but the pressure goes down. Because we want the pressure coming into this condenser to be the same as the pressure coming out of this turbine so there's no backflow, right? So the flow goes in the direction we want it to go. Right, so in this closed feed water system, then the mass flow rate comes together in the condenser, whereas the open system, the mass flow rate comes back together in the open feed water heater. The undiverted mass flow rate, right, that's going to be my blue line here, it goes through this second turbine. In the open system, it goes through the condenser, through this first pump, and gets back together with the diverted mass flow rate in the open feed water heater. In the closed feed water heater system, again, it goes through the second turbine, that part's the same, but then it goes into this condenser and that's where the mass flow rate gets back together. Finally, you have the total mass flow rate, which I'm showing in purple. In the open feed water heater system, this is the outlet from the open feed water heater, right? Because I have, you know, let's say it's 20% of the mass flow rate plus 80% of the mass flow rate. If I did conservation of mass on this, 20% plus 80% equals 100%. So all the mass flow rate comes out. It goes through this second pump and all through the boiler, all through the first turbine. In the closed feed water heater, I look for where the mass flow rate gets back together. Again, if we pretend that Y is 20%, right, then one minus Y is 80%. I have 80% of the mass flow coming into the condenser over here, 20% of the mass flow rate coming into the condenser over here, 100% of the mass flow rate comes out of the condenser through this pump, through this side of the closed feed water heater, through the steam generator or the boiler, and then through the first turbine. Right? And I could give you, I have given people on exams super complicated Rankine cycles. Maybe they have four turbines. Maybe they have an open feed water heater and a closed feed water heater. But it doesn't matter how complicated the system is. Because when we do the analysis, it's always the same. Right? We're going to think about the isentrop or the thermal efficiency, which is going to be the net power divided by the heat rate in where the sum of all the turbine powers plus the sum of all the pump powers divided by the sum of all the places where we add the heat, right? So let's take a look at an open feed water heater system and see how we go about doing the first law for all these components. Now, unfortunately, this one's the hardest, right? These the regeneration systems are the hardest because for all the other Rankine cycles we talked about, remember we said, oh, it's at steady state and every component has one inlet and one outlet and they're all chained together in series, which means there's only one mass flow rate. That's not the case here because there's a parallel path, right? Water can either go this route, the red route or the blue route, right? So there's different mass flow rates 
for different components in these and it's not even different components for different ports on different components they can get in a different mass flow rate <coughs> so let's say we wanted to find the thermal efficiency of an open feed water heater system i start with the definition of thermal efficiency right it's energy benefit divided by the energy cost and because this is a heat engine the energy benefit is my net power and the energy cost is the heat that I put into the system. So, before I start to do conservation of energy, I have to think about conservation of mass. Which means I have to think about what mass flow rate gets pinned to each inlet and each outlet of each component. It's important to note here that different mass flow rates can get pinned to the same state. If I'm thinking about the outlet of this first turbine, that's state two, but it's all the mass flow rate. If I think about the inlet of this open feed water heater over here, right, that's 20% of the mass flow rate that's again at state two, for example, right, if Y was 20%. Right? So this part of state two gets 20% of the mass flow rate. But state two is also the inlet into my second turbine. So it can get, if Y was 20%, it can get one minus Y or 80% of the mass flow rate going into the second turbine. So I have to think about the percentage of the mass flow rate, the percentage of the total mass flow rate, in terms not of the state number, but in terms of the inlet or outlet port of every component. Again, my advice to you is when you're doing these problems, draw the lines in color because it makes it much easier. You do that once and now I can just look at this diagram and say, what's the mass flow rate for each inlet and each outlet of each component? So, when we talk about the mass flow rates here, and this will become apparent why we do this when we start talking about the thermal efficiency, we're not going to talk about the total mass flow rate, right? We're going to talk about what percentage of the maximum mass flow rate happens at each inlet or outlet. If you're reading textbook problems, it will usually say, um, you know, something like the mass flow rate divided by the mass flow rate through the steam generator. Because in all these problems, all the mass flow rate goes to the steam generator, right? Or per unit mass flowing through the steam generator or something like that, right? It's usually kind of wordy. So I'm going to look at my favorite components here are the components where a colored line goes through the whole component, right? So there are some components where the inlet and the outlet get the same mass flow rate and it's the total mass flow. So for this open feed water heater, the high pressure turbine, that's the first turbine, gets all the mass flow rate, one times the total mass flow rate, right? Because this purple line goes all the way through this first turbine. Then it splits, right? But this pump, pump number two, also I get this purple line, go, it touches the inlet and the outlet, goes through that whole component, right? So state six and state seven when i'm talking about the inlet and the outlet of the pump get the whole mass flow rate this boiler or steam generator also gets the whole mass flow rate at the inlet and the outlet there are some components that get the whole undiverted mass flow rate this is one minus y or if y were 20 percent so y is usually the smaller component right then this would be 80%, right? So the second turbine gets this 80% of the mass flow rate at the inlet and the outlet. So the low pressure turbine, there's only one mass flow rate associated with the low pressure turbine. Only one mass flow rate associated with the condenser. Only one mass flow rate associated with the first pump, right? But then the feed water heater is a problem. In these cases, the trickiest components are the ones that have more than one inlet and more than one outlet because they're going to have different mass flow rates 
at each different inlet or outlet, right? Or at least potentially they do, right? So here, at state five for the open feed water heater, at this inlet, I get one minus y times the mass flow rate. That's 80% if y was 20, right? At this other inlet where I get the diverted mass flow rate, that would be 20% if y was 20%. But this is where the mass all comes together, right? So if I did conservation of mass here and I was at steady state, so there's not a change in mass in the system, right? I'm not collecting or depleting mass in the feed water heater. Then that would mean 20% comes in here, 80% comes in here. So 100%'s got to go out at the exit. Bring your colored pencils. And remember that the mass flow rate doesn't get pegged to the state. Right? Because here, the outlet of the high-pressure turbine is state 2, and it gets 100% of the mass flow rate. The inlet to the low-pressure turbine is state 2, and it gets, if we keep our Y at 20%, it gets 80% of the mass flow rate. And the open feed water heater inlet here is at state 2, and it gets 20% of the mass flow rate. Right? So we've got to think in terms of inlet and outlet ports, not in terms of state numbers. Does that kind of make sense? Color pencils are your friends when you're doing these problems. Now we got to think about how do we do thermal efficiency. Now that I've thought about the mass flow rates, which was kind of trivial in all the other Rankine cycles we did because there's only one mass flow rate, but not trivial in these problems, now I can start to think about how do I do conservation of energy to get things like net power or heat rate in. So if I want turbine powers and pump powers, right, I got to count up how many turbines do I have for this open feed water heater, you know, for this particular regeneration cycle that uses one open feed water heater, I have two turbines and two pumps, which means four different first law analyses. But the good news is turbines and pumps the first law analysis is really kind of the same. We're going to expect the answers to look something like the powers here are m dot times h in minus h out. The turbine powers are positive and the pump powers are negative. Is what we're expecting. So I'm going to add these all up. I color code these. Another reason why colored pencils are good. I'm adding these all up. But the turbine powers are positive and the pump powers are negative. Here's where it starts to get tricky, right? First, I can just think about this from the normal first law analysis that I do. I would say the turbines and pumps are at steady state. They're adiabatic, so the Q dot term goes away. Each one of these components is still one inlet and one outlet, but the mass flow rates are not the same, but there's only one mass flow rate associated with each one of these turbines and pumps. I'm going to neglect kinetic and potential energy, so I still get M dot times H in minus H out. Unfortunately, the mass flow rate that goes through each one of these components is not the same mass flow rate. That's what makes this problem more complicated than all the other Rankine cycle problems. Right? So the first turbine gets the entire mass flow rate. The second turbine gets what we're calling the undiverted mass flow rate, the blue line. The first pump gets the undiverted mass flow rate, and the second pump gets all the mass flow rate. We like to keep these things as functions of the total mass flow rate. So there is still, we're making all of these relative to the maximum max mass flow rate, or as the textbook might say, the mass flow rate that flows through the steam generator. Right? And we do that because then when we get our thermal efficiency, remember how before the M dots always canceled out? That's still gonna happen here but we're going to be left with these fractions of 1 minus y or sometimes y. So here our process is still the same. You do the first law on all the turbines. You do the first law on all the pumps. Just the answer is messier because the mass flow rate is different through these different components. So if I think about the mass flow rate, the, this is another one. 
So if you're reading a textbook problem, it will call this little w dot, which is big w dot divided by the total mass flow rate. The textbook will call this, this little w dot, they'll call this the net power per unit mass flowing through the steam generator. So it's kind of wordy, but it means w dot net divided by m dot total, or m dot maximum, if you like. And now, our expression, if this was a reheat cycle, it would just be an expression of the enthalpies. So we'd have H's in there. But now, it's an expression of all these different enthalpies and this um, parameter Y, right? Or in this case, 1 minus Y, which is the mass flow rate that goes through that second turbine. Does the process here kind of make sense? Or does anybody have any questions? So that's the numerator for our thermal efficiency. The denominator will be about the heat rate in. And the nice thing about a regeneration problem like this is this just looks like the same heat rate in that would go into um, a four component Rankine cycle, although the state numbers are different, right? There's only one place where we're adding heat. We're gonna make the same assumptions we usually do through the steam generator. So that Q dot in is going to be M dot times H out minus H in. M dot of the boiler is the total mass flow rate. This was the purple line went all the way through this. Right? H out is state one. H in is state seven. Right? So I get M dot times H1 minus H7. If I talked about the heat rate in per unit mass flowing through the steam generator, that's little Q dot. Right? or big Q dot over M dot, and that's H1 minus H7, or H out minus H in, if the problem got more and more complicated and the numbers looked different. So if I wanted my thermal efficiency for this open feed water regenerative system, it's my net power per unit mass flowing through the system divided by my heat rate in per unit mass flowing through the steam generator. Here I see it's a function of all the H's and Y. That makes this problem harder because not only do I have to fix all the states to get the H values, I also have to figure out how to find Y. Y is like a mass flow rate. We generally have three different options for finding mass flow rates. I can look for some place where I know an area, a velocity, and a specific volume, or a volumetric flow rate and a specific volume. But usually that's not how we find Y in these problems. Maybe there's some component where I know a power or a heat rate, for example, if they told me the net power, that would be this numerator. If I knew the net power times m dot, then I could solve for y. But usually, so I, if, I, if there's a known power or heat rate, I can do that. Um, but usually what I'm going to have to do is look for some component that has more than one inlet and more than one outlet. And I'm going to use that to find a mass flow rate. Basically, if you have a regeneration problem and you haven't yet done the first law on the regenerator and you're stuck, do the first law on the regenerator. So if we look at this open feed water heater, right? I'm gonna say that it's at steady state, that it's adiabatic. So that means it's very well insulated. So all the heat from the hot inlet gets mixed with the cold inlet to give us the warm outlet. Right? So none of the heat is lost to the environment. In this case, doesn't always have to be that way. But that's an assumption we might expect to make. No power generation because there's no fan blades inside this thing. It's not one inlet, one outlet. So I can't get rid of those summation signs but I can neglect kinetic and potential energy, and I'm going to get either 
that zero is equal to the sum of the mass flow rates in H in minus the sum of the mass flow rates out H out, or that m dot the sum of m dot in H in is equal to the sum of m dot out H out, or E here stands for exit. In this case, I have two inlets and one outlet. This is why when we talked about the mass flow rates, we talked about them as fractions of the total mass flow rate. So here, the mass flow rate is m dot total times y. Here, the mass flow rate is m dot total times 1 minus y, right? So I get m dot total times y times h2 plus 1 minus y times h5, right? And at the outlet, it's just the total mass flow rate. And because I thought of all these mass flow rates as a fraction of the total mass flow rate, I can cancel out m dot total from both sides of this equation. I don't need to know what the total mass flow rate is. It just drops out. And that will let me, if I can fix all the states, right? So then here in this equation, my unknowns are h2, h5, and h6, as well as y. So if I'm trying to find y, what will often happen is, oh, now I've got to walk through all the states and find h2, h5, and h6. And if I know all those things, then I can use this equation to get an expression for y. So usually, when I'm doing a regeneration problem, first, I do conservation of mass at all the inlets and outlets to figure, right, get out with your colored pencils figure out what mass flow rates go with what ports on what components. Then I do the first law on the turbines, the pumps, and the places where I'm adding heat. Then I'm going to get an expression for something like thermal efficiency that's going to be a function of H's and Y. i got to fix all the states just like I do in all the other Rankine cycle problems. That'll give me the H's. Then i got to find Y. Usually I will find Y as the first law on the open feed water heater. Another variation of that is that a problem could tell me what y is, but then usually they won't give me what h6 is. I still have to do the first law on the open feed water heater, but then I would get the same expression and I would know y, h2, and h5 but I wouldn't know H6, so I'd still use this expression. So if you feel like you get stuck in a regeneration problem, try doing the first law on the regenerator, because that's definitely going to be the answer for one of the parts. So even if it's not the current part, you know, don't erase it or scratch it out or whatever. Just put a box around it and figure out what part you're going to know next, right? Or maybe you do this and you say, oh, Dr. Schertz, I'd really love to solve this problem. <clears throat> but I don't know H6 and I don't know why. So I know I'm going to need this equation, but I can't use it yet. Right. So that's the open feed water heater. We're going to use a similar system, right? So always use the same process. We're going to use a different process for, a, or the same process for a closed feed water heater. We're just going to get a different answer, right? Which is, again, why I could give you a super complicated problem but if you know how to do the process, it doesn't matter how complicated it is because it's always the same thing, right? So for a closed feed water heater, it's still power, net power over heat rate in, right? I'm still going to have to find what's the right mass flow rate to go with which component on which, um, which inlet and outlet on which component, right? I'm still going to have to do the first law on all the turbines, the pumps, and the places where we're adding heat, right? I'm still going to have to find why, right? So the first thing that I want to do is think about conservation of mass. So what's going on at what port, right? So here it's tricky because I have two components that have more than one inlet and more than one outlet. That makes this problem more difficult, potentially, right? Because my condenser has two inlets and one outlet. And my closed side of my feed water heater, ha or my closed feed water heater has a hot side and a cold side. Remember, though, that if we're at steady state and we have something like this, like a shell and tube heat exchanger, a heat exchanger where the fluids don't mix, 
then the mass flow rate at, in this case, state two and state seven are the same, and at state five and state six are the same. Because the purpose of the closed feed water heater is not to cross the streams, right? We're not mixing these mass flow rates. Again, I look for components where my colored line goes through the whole component. Or at least, well, let, now we'll say the whole component, right? So that's the first turbine, the only pump, and the steam generator. My blue line goes all the way through my second turbine. And then I got to think about the components that have more than one inlet and more than one outlet. In the condenser, at state, it's, it's hard to see here, but this is state three. At state three, I have one minus y times the mass flow rate. At state eight, coming in here, I have y times the mass flow rate. And at state four, the outlet, because the condenser is where all the mass comes back together. Then here, I have all of the mass flow rate comes out at state four. For the closed feed water heater, it's nice because the red side and the purple side, there's only two mass flow rates, right? So here, state five and state six get the whole mass flow rate. My purple line went all the way through here. State two and state seven get the diverted mass flow rate, or Y, which 20% is what we were talking about before, the smaller component of the mass flow rate. So now, because I took my colored pencils and drew this all through, I know what mass flow rate goes with which port in which component. Right? That's the first part of the battle. Now, now it starts to look like all the other problems. Right? So first I take my net power. So I take the sum of all the turbine powers plus the sum of all the pump powers. I have two turbines, but only one pump. So I'm going to get W dot turbine one plus W dot turbine two plus W dot pump one, which is a negative value. I make the same assumptions I usually do for these turbines and pumps. So they're all M dot times H in minus H out. I add them all up and let the first law worry about the sign. But all of these components had a single color line going through them. The first turbine got all the mass flow rate. The pump got all the mass flow rate. And the second turbine got the undiverted mass flow rate. Again, I can think about this as the net power per unit mass flowing through the steam generator. I can divide by the total mass flow rate. And I get a function that's, or that's only a function of the enthalpies and this diverted mass flow rate y. Or if you want to think about it as the undiverted mass flow rate, 1 minus y. I can do the same thing through the steam generator. Just like the four component Rankine cycle, we only have one place where we're adding heat. So I only have to do the first law on one boiler. This is going to be m dot times h out, h1 minus h in, h6. And the mass flow rate through the boiler or the steam generator is the total mass flow rate. So now I know the numerator and the denominator in my thermal efficiency. And I can get an equation for my thermal efficiency that's a function of the enthalpies and this diverted mass flow rate y. So again, I'm kind of stuck with this question of, well, first, how do I fix the states? But hopefully we're starting to get familiar with that, or at least we'll get familiar with that as we catch up with the homework, right? So if I could find all the states, I still can't find the thermal efficiency unless I find Y. Typically to find Y, I'm looking for, oh, do I know what the net power is? Or maybe they just told me the power developed by the second turbine, that'd be nice of them, right? Or I'm looking for some component that has more than one inlet and more than one out and or more than one outlet but for this closed feed water heater system there's two options right i have the closed feed water heater but i also have the condenser right so let's see what happens if i look at that um those two components my first option if i have the choice is usually going to be the closed feed water heater 
because here I can say that this is adiabatic. So this just looks like the open feed water heater before in that the first law is going to tell me that the sum of the mass flow rates in H in are equal to the sum of the mass flow rates out times H out. Here though, I'm going to think about the inlets and outlets on the same side, right? There's the hot side mass flow rate and the cold side mass flow rate. So this is going to say, that I can first say the inlets, right? The inlets are going to be Y times H2 plus all the mass flow rate times H5. And the outlet is Y times H7 plus all the mass flow rate times H6. Probably I would group these by Y times the mass flow rate and one times the mass flow rate, but this would be fine too. M dot total cancels. And if I knew the enthalpy values, then I could find the diverted mass flow rate. It's also possible to do a first law analysis on the condenser, right? But the problem's a little harder if I do it that way because I need to know what's going on with Q dot. So here, if I did the first law of the condenser as it's written in this particular picture, I would need to know Q dot to do the first law analysis because I can't assume that this condenser by itself is adiabatic because its purpose is to reject heat, right? This squiggly line Q dot out crosses my boundary of my control volume. So I need to know what Q dot out is to fix the state. But if I was told how much heat was rejected by the condenser, or I had cooling water, some mass flow rate coming in, mass flowing going out, and some temperature difference across the cooling water, then I could also do a first law analysis to find Q dot out, and I could put that in. So generally, for these regeneration problems, I want to figure out what mass flow rate goes with which port on which component, do a bunch of first law analyses on a bunch of different components to get an expression for thermal efficiency. And then I got to look for some component with one inlet and one outlet, usually, but I guess not always, the feed water heater. And hopefully I'll use that to find why. I have a bit of an example here. Right? Oh, this is not the right. Oh, here we go. We'll do this part of the so this is a closed feed water heater problem. Let's get to here. Now, if you got a problem like this on the final exam, so again, won't be on the midterm, um, you might look at this and say like, oh, he picked this one and it's the most complicated one, right? But the good news about these complicated problems if you see this and you get intimidated, especially if I give you a super crazy one that you haven't seen before, your first reaction is probably going to be, I don't know how to do this. I've never seen a problem like this. If you have that reaction, my advice to you is going to be, hey, look at the state table because it's mostly filled out. What that means is you get the smile because all you need to really do mostly is do the symbolic solution because if you get the symbolic solution usually for these cycle analysis problems it's finding h that takes the most time right but here we have almost every h the only h we don't have is at state six so let's look at this problem this problem says the network per kilogram of mass flowing through the boiler is some number find the mass fraction diverted at the high pressure turbine and the enthalpy at state six. Let's also go through and derive an equation for the thermal efficiency, right? So we'll do that maybe first, right? I'll keep the colors the same, but I'm gonna take my own medicine here, right? So I get all of the mass flow rate, right? It starts it comes back together in this condenser, right? And it goes over here. All of the mass flow rate goes through my first turbine. Oh, I don't know why that happens either. So it comes out up through here. Right? 
Okay. Now, my diverted mass flow rate is going to be this red line. It crosses here, goes through this trap up here, and comes into the condenser. And then my undiverted mass flow rate goes through here. Right? So if I wanted an expression for... Uh-oh. My... Let's say that I wanted an expression for thermal efficiency. Right? This is going to be W dot net divided by Q dot in. W dot net, I look at my turbine. I have two different turbines. So this is going to be W dot of turbine 1 plus W dot of turbine 2. Those are positive numbers. Plus W dot of the pump. There's only one pump. I expect that to be a negative number. Divided by, I'm only adding heat in one place, Q dot through the boiler. I would do the first law on all of these components. DE by DT is equal to Q dot minus W dot plus the sum of M dot in. This is a metric problem. H in plus V in squared over 2 plus GZ in minus the sum of M dot out h out plus v out squared over 2 plus g z out for all my components at least all my components that fit in here they're going to be steady state they're all no they're not all adiabatic They're all going to be one inlet and one outlet because I'm thinking about separating the mass at this node in between, right? They're all going to neglect kinetic and potential energies. For the turbines and pumps, we're going to say that they're adiabatic. And for the boiler, we're going to say that it's passive. So if... I'm trying to find power for some turbine or for some pump. It's going to be M dot times H in minus H out. But if I'm trying to find Q dot for, say, the boiler, it's going to be M dot times H out minus H in. So turbine one, right? If I think about my thermal efficiency, Turbine 1 gets all the mass flow rate. So this is going to be m dot total, right? Because my purple line goes all the way through this first turbine times h1 is the inlet, h2 is the outlet. My second turbine gets the, divert, the undiverted mass flow rate, 1 minus y times m dot times inlet minus outlet, h2 minus h3. Now, my pump gets the whole mass flow rate, m dot, h in minus h out, h4 minus h5, divided by, it's hard to draw lines on these pads. Although, like I think I've said before, it's hard for me to draw straight lines on the board too. m dot, this is where we're adding heat, h out minus h in, this is going to be h1, minus H6. Because this is thermal efficiency, we have mass flow rate on the top and on the bottom. So I can get a thermal efficiency if I knew all the H's, right? And in this problem, I know most of the H's, just not H6. So I know H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, but I don't know H6, and I don't know why. So this problem doesn't ask for the thermal efficiency, but you can see I could find the thermal efficiency if I found the two things that it asks me to find. Right. So how do I find Y? Y is a mass flow rate. I have three options basically to find mass flow rates. I can look for some place where I know the area times the velocity divided by the specific volume. 
This is the same thing as the volumetric flow rate over the specific volume. I don't have that. I can look for some place where there's more than one inlet and more than one outlet, and I can do the first law. I got lots of places for that. I have, uh, when I look at this, I think about, oh, maybe I could do the closed feed, water, heater. Maybe I could do the condenser, right? Both of those components have more than one inlet and more than one outlet. But my third option, always good to think about all three of these options. My third option is some place where W dot or Q dot is known and then do the first law. This, we know little w dot net. Right? Because the problem told me little w dot net is this. But let's say I didn't see that yet. Right? Let's say this is an exam. I'm under all kinds of time pressure. And, and I'm like, oh, how do I find Y? Um, I find Y by doing a first law analysis on the closed feed water heater. Why is there no mouse here? I don't know what happened to my mouse. Oh, we're back. Look at this. I bet you I'm losing batteries. One sec. That's why you always have rechargeable batteries ready in your office, right? So I'm going to say... Well, usually Dr. Scherzer said this is the right answer. So my closed feed water heater looks something like this. I have um, an inlet and an outlet here, and an inlet and an outlet here. This is state two, two to seven, right? Two to seven, and this is five to six. We're going to do a first law analysis over here. This is going to be DE by DT. Again, I'm going to write the whole thing out. Q dot minus W dot. I write this out again because here it's a little bit different than, um, than when I was doing it for just the turbines and the pumps. So I do, I prefer to not have to write it out again because it does take a little bit of time. But I think it's time well spent on an exam because when you write out the first law, you get to demonstrate your understanding. So for this component, this is the closed feed water heater. It's steady state, adiabatic, passive. It's not one inlet or one outlet, but I can say that um, it's no kinetic or potential energy changes, zero. And if you don't want to write down the words, but you write down the equation and you cross stuff out, I know what that means. So you can write down the words if you want, but you don't necessarily have to. This is the sum of m dot in h in oops, minus the sum of m dot out h out. I'm going to write this was y coming in here and this was 1 going in here going to group these by mass flow rates so this is m dot total times y h in is h2 minus h out is h7 plus 1 times m dot total h in is state 5 minus h6 so here I can cancel out that I can divide right if I divide this by m dot total 
right? Then I can get rid of that. I want to isolate for y here. So what I would do is I would say that y is equal to, I got to move this term to the other side of the equation. This is going to be h6 minus h5 divided by this term over here, h2 minus h7. Now, in this particular problem, we know almost all the h's, so I feel pretty good about this, but the one h we don't know is h6. So in this problem, I know h5 and h2 and h7, but I don't know h6 and I don't know y. That means I picked the wrong option of my three options to find y. If this happens to you on exam, don't cross it out because this is going to be the equation you use for the next part in the problem. So it turned out that this was not the right option. So I'm going to look for this. Here, I know little w dot net, right? And that's the numerator in my thermal efficiency. So this is going to be h1 minus h2 plus 1 minus y times h2 minus h3 plus h4 minus h5 or I could say 1 minus y times h2 minus h3 is equal to little w dot net minus h1 minus h2 minus h4 minus h5 or 1 minus y and in this problem mathematically i'm going to solve for 1 minus y instead of making my symbolic solution a little more complicated it's going to be w dot net minus h1 minus h2 minus h4 minus h5 divided by h2 minus h3. In this equation, I don't know this, but I do know this. I know the only h I don't know is h6. So from this, I get 1 minus y is equal to some number. From that, I find y, and the next piece it wants me to do is h6, and this is the reason why I didn't erase this, because here, if y becomes known, then I can use y to find h6. In these problems, you're almost always and I'm going to, well, I won't say always, but always, you're going to have to do the first law on the feed water heater. It might not happen at exactly the time where you think it might happen. Like in this case, I couldn't solve this because there were two unknowns. But don't cross that out, right? Instead, go through and look at one of the other options to find why. The beauty of this is that if you get a problem like this and it's really complicated and you get stuck, one of your options, one of the things that's always good to do is to write down the first law on whatever feed water heater or heaters that there are, right? If you get a problem on the final exam that looks really, really complicated, try your best not to get overwhelmed by it. Trust the process. The process is the same, whether it's a four component Rankine cycle or a super crazy Rankine regeneration with reheat problem. You're going to say, how do I get my thermal efficiency? It's the sum of the turbine powers plus the sum of the pump powers divided by all the places where I'm adding heat. Maybe I'm going to have to do the conservation of mass if it's a regeneration problem, if it's not, the mass flow rates are just all the same. Then I do the first law. 
Turbine powers and pump power is probably going to look something like m dot times h in minus h out. Heat rate's probably going to look something like m dot times h out minus h in. That'll give me some expression. You got to go through and fix the states. The blessing, the good thing about the super complicated ones is you'll have to fix fewer states. And the state fixing stuff is the tedious stuff, right? Um, if you need to find why, you've got three options. You're pro and it's really probably only two because I've never written a problem like this where I gave you an area of velocity in a specific volume. So you're probably really only looking for the first law on some component that's got more than one inlet and more than one outlet. Or if you know, say the net power, use that. And, and it's really, maybe I should order these in the opposite um way because usually do this first well really do this first but it's probably not going to be that right this is the easiest way this if they give you something like a net power use it right look at what the given information is but even if you do it in in the wrong order like this don't cancel it out because if it's a regeneration problem, 100% of the time, you're going to have to do the first law analysis on the regenerative heater. Probably it's going to be to find why, but maybe instead it will be to find some enthalpy, like the enthalpy of the outlet, like it was in this case. So that's all that I have for you. And that's the end of our time with Rankine cycles. So next class, we're going to talk about internal combustion engines. To make sure this feed water, yes. So the feed water, so this is a good problem, right? So, so we talked about open systems. That's on the first law, right? Or on the, on the exam. So that's conservation of mass, conservation of energy, second law, right? We talked about, this is all the stuff that's on the midterm, right? We talked about, um, what did we do next? We did these kind of problems. These are like Calvin and Planck type problems, right? This, you know, where you have heat going here, heat going here and work coming out. What's the Carnot? efficiency, right? Or maybe it's Carnot coefficient of performance if it looks like if the heat's going the wrong way. That's on the exam. And then we did four component Rankine cycles. Or did I, I mix those two up, right? Here there's the condenser and then the pump, right? So here, this is, how do we do this, right? So this is, we need the thermal efficiency of the Rankine cycle. So this is W dot net divided by q dot in. So that's on the, right? Um, since then, what we talked about today is how do we improve thermal efficiency, right? So here we can get uh, T hot up or T cold down. We can do reheat or we can do regen. This stuff is testable on the final exam, but it won't be on the midterm, at least not directly, right? So we saw that, you know, when we did our superheat example, that was really just a four component Rankine cycle. So you could see a problem like that on the exam. The reheat example that we did, you won't have, um, you won't have a reheat cycle, but in the example, we used 
the isentropic efficiencies of the turbines and the pumps to find the real outlets. That could be on the exam, right? So this is um, inside this conservation of energy is um, isentropic efficiencies of turbines and pumps, right? Um, regeneration, the hardest thing here is how do you find Y, right? So you won't have to do any of that, but it's still sort of, if you think about the general process for Rankine cycles, it's still this. So that concept is on the exam, but nothing nearly as complicated as a, re, as a regeneration cycle. It will only be a four-component Rankine cycle on the exam. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it does feel like a lot. And uh, I mean, this is usually in the class, if this was like the like a normal 15-week class, I would say, oh, when we start to get into cycles, it really feels like drinking from a fire hose. But we've been drinking from a fire hose since day one in this six-week class, right? So, um, you know, next class, we're going to talk about um, internal combustion engines. That's usually like a week of work. But we're going to do it in a night, right? And then we're going to talk about um, gas power plants. So natural gas power plants. Again, that's usually about a week of work. We're going to do it in usually in, in sort of about a night. Then we'll talk about um, jet engines. So for like uh, aircraft. Uh, again, usually that's a, around a week of work. We'll do it in a night. And then we'll talk about uh, heat pumps and refrigerators. And uh, that's usually like probably two classes, but we'll do it in, in like half a day. So, and then I think we'll have at least one full class for review for the final. And I'll try to keep open uh, at least one segment of our class next Tuesday for review as well. So we're done with what we need to know for the midterm. So the how we fix the state stuff will be a little bit different. Um, but it's still all the general process where we got to think about the first law for all these different components or all these different processes. All right. I didn't have anything else for you. Um, did anybody have any questions? All right. I will see you on Thursday evening. Um, again, I know there's at least one conflict with the Wednesday exam. Please send me uh, an email and we'll figure out a time to write that test. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.